Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Public Works po Podcast. My name is Joseph Blackman. Today, got a real treat for you. His name is Graham Watts. He is, he is the Emergency Services Manager for the city of Thousand Oaks in beautiful California. Graham, say what's up to everybody. Hey, what's up, Joseph? Hello. Very good to meet you and say hi to everybody for me. Yeah. And it is your birthday today. So what, you turn Amazing. 26 or 22? I won't, I won't tell you the number, but it is a big day. <laughs> it is a big day. This is the first podcast I've had that has been on a birthday. So, All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> All right. So you're the emergency services manager. I know you got a lot more... Um, a lot more under your belt than just being an emergency services manager. So let's start at the beginning here. Was, you know, 12, 15 year old Graham, was he looking at emergency services? I mean, where'd you get your start at? What, what kind of led you into the public works path? You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, there was a questionnaire put out for my son who's 11 and asked him if he closed his eyes, where would he imagine himself being in 10, 15, 20 years? And he said, being drafted by major league baseball. Now, yeah. I probably would have had a similar uh, vision, but it certainly wasn't becoming an emergency services manager for the city of Thousand Oaks. I didn't know how or where I would end up, to be honest, And uh, but I'm very grateful to be where I am. It's been a, a wild ride, but you learn everything with every twist and turn. So how long have you been in the industry and like, did you bounce around from city to city, department to department, or did you, did you, did you? Start at 19 in, as, as the emergency <laughs> services manager. <laughs> so I, I came out of college in uh, the 80s, mid 80s, and uh, started working in youth employment services and job placement, job counseling. Did that for a couple of years for the city of Simi Valley. And then eventually I found myself with an opportunity to become the recycling coordinator for the city of Thousand Oaks. And so my job then in 1990 was to implement the city's curbside and commercial recycling program. So we had the first program rolled out in Ventura County in 1990 as a result of what's called AB 939, which said, hey, everybody reduce your waste 50% or we will fine you. Well, we did that and much more. But after that, I did that for about 10, 15, 10 12 years. And then one day the city manager said, hey, could you do this emergency management thing? It's You just need to do the plan and then just, just keep an eye, just be the point person. Well, it was a lot more than that. So since then, I've been doing it for another 10, 12 years, and we've been through a lot of uh, incidents, uh, man-made and otherwise, that have occurred in Thousand Oaks and Ventura County, and it's been uh, crazy. So it's an emerging, constantly moving industry in the public and private sector and i'm just very grateful to work for a, a great city and an excellent department with good people so we're, we're well prepared for what is coming the best we can gotcha walk us through what a thursday looks like for graham i mean you wake up you know you brush your teeth you put on a, a shirt or two you get to the office. What are you doing from the time you get there to the time you clock out? And if you weren't hopping on a podcast with me, like what would you be doing all day? Well, and if it wasn't my birthday, it'd be a little different. But actually, today was a typical day. You have uh, one meeting after another and one project and one deadline after another. And they range from what's happening right now is we're applying for a massive grant through the federal government that requires a lot of cooperation from multiple people that are experts in their field that would help mitigate future disasters or damage to our city with a little infrastructure improvements and some battery backup components, all part of a mass, mass application for funding. So that's taking up a bulk of my time today. Uh, we just finished multiple projects having to do with on-call consultant agreements where we have you know, up, up to 100 different companies on board. And I'm in the middle of just finishing what we call our accreditation program that we've been working on for about a year now, where departments uh, throughout the nation are accredited through the American Public Works Association. We have about 600 practices, policies, and procedures. We have them all standardized. They go through them, make sure we've done our part. And then they say, hey, let's accredit it. 
that's a credit you is one of those model agencies. So we're right on the cusp of having that done for the fourth time. So we've been doing this since 2010. It's kind of a big deal. And it certainly is in public works. We're one of only two agencies in Ventura County that are fully accredited. So we're proud of the work we do. Congrats on that. It's huge. It's, it always says something when, you know, humans or cities or you know businesses they go for that extra that extra credit an extra step of learning continuing education so i appreciate absolutely that. um and and you talked about some big funding you're going out for for the um for your emergency uh kind of department it, is that a part of the virg virtual emergency operations centers and can you enlighten us about what that is yeah so you know COVID impacted everybody and it still does but we found ourselves working remotely and I started thinking, well, if we're going to work remotely, we're going to need to respond remotely. So in, in the traditional sense, uh, companies and agencies go to what's termed their emergency operations center that has TVs and computers and phones and all the documents and resources and food and water to, you know, staff the EOC. Well, you know, in a COVID world, you can't really do that. And in the middle of the night when there is a fire, how does it make sense to run to a room and then open your computer and then, you know, personally speak to people from a distance, but also jump on your computer? So we decided that our approach would be through a virtual world, like most of what we're doing every day. And so we created a virtual operations center that has a 24 hour zoom meeting link capability and all the technical resources and fill-in type documents and our entire team is part of a microsoft world um, bridge and platform we can communicate at all times 24 hours a day with a small group or our entire team and we've used it during fires and power outages and we continue to support it. So it's just a great tool that was came out as a result of COVID, and uh, we keep building on it. That's cool. It's, it, I, I used to like to ask that question of, we know what COVID did, you know, we know the, the damage it, it caused, but usually in despair and in, in, um, in those adverse situations, good things come out of it. And, and you know, you make a good point. People are working remote. So how can we reach them in emergency wise on the remote side also? Well, I, I, and thankfully, our city is completely connected uh, with all of our technology. We we continue to operate remotely and none of our services were impacted because we did everything in a virtual world or with electronic capabilities that don't require face to face interaction. Uh, and uh, our city has benefited from that. So it's advanced technology and making government more efficient. Gotcha. So you're the emergency services manager. Let's say you're you're talking to a, a mentee of yours. You know, they're 22 years old. They're fresh out of college. They're ready to take over the world and, and just make the world a better place. What kind of skill set would you tell them to pick up along their journey to be successful at what you do today? Well, I will tell you that this skill set I have now, I did not have when I came on board. It comes with experience. Experience does matter. Institutional ma uh, awareness does matter. But more often than not, what really has helped me is just to listen and to learn and to be open-minded to change and support the process and integrate into the culture. And more importantly, something I learned very late in the game, don't hold on to credit, give it away. It doesn't do you any good. Don't look for who did what and try to get your name listed or recognized. People know what who did what. And it's important to enhance relationships and work with everyone. There's always going to be one or two people that you just don't jive well. But don't make that person an enemy. Make them an, a support partner and embrace them with kindness. They won't know what to do with it. So I learned all these things late in life. And uh, I think it's important to bring solutions to problems. Don't bring problems without solutions. It took me a while to figure that out. It's not your boss's problem. It's your problem. Find a way to fix it and give them the tools that you need to get it done. And I've gotten pretty good at that over the years, but it took me a, a while to get that down. 
Hey, you talk about problems and, and your your line of work is emergencies. So I'm sure you have a lot of stories for us. So I need a story from you of something that went wrong under your watch, what you did to rectify, and then what lessons you learned from it to apply to your future career. Well, you know, I, I think of several emergencies we've been through, all of which we as an agency improved with each one and identified areas that we need to improve. But I will tell you, many years ago, I remember getting a phone call from an uh, expert or a reliable source that indicated that there was a gas leak in our city. And they provided the exact address. They said, hey, you're, you have a gas leak. You need to act. And so what I did with that credible, what I thought was credible information was pass that on to my supervisor who then passed it on to the city manager and the council. Well, it turned out that that was not credible information. And what happened was people reacted and when they didn't need to, and they wondered where that source came from. So I told them what was shared with me. I did not specifically point out <laughs> who gave it to me because I acted on it. And that was a learning experience for me that during emergencies, lots of misinformation and rumors and flat out falsehoods occur. So the number one rule with anything in terms of an emergency is always remain calm. If you panic, you're done. But the other part of it is verify information. And in that case, I did not. I simply passed it on. I should have just taken a breath confirmed it, and then act accordingly. I didn't, but I have certainly learned from that incident. You know, I, I, I like what you're saying, that you're learning as you're going. You said you came in, in your position without the skill set of listening that you kind of, that you possess now. Um, and I always like to say, why doesn't Graham, since you've been doing this for X amount of years, like, why can't you just put your feet up on the desk and say, you know what, I know everything. I've seen every emergency. I know how to handle everything. Like, what causes Graham to keep his sword sharp? And then what actionable items do you do to, to keep up with the times and, you know, your, your daily, weekly, monthly personal development regimen to, to stay up with what's new and innovative out there? Well, I am far less reactionary to anything. So... Nothing really surprises me what happens locally, certainly what happens nationally. I keep up to speed on everything, but there are no more surprises. Life is just crazy. But I double check everything now, I verify, and I always look for what is the intent? So if something's coming your way and you're not quite sure why or what someone's doing, I say, look back and discuss or evaluate what is their purpose? What is their intent? And I have always learned that with whatever you're doing, uh, double check, verify, include correct punctuation in your emails, and always remember, please and thank you. You may be in a hurry and you may want something quick and fast, but take a breath and remain professional at all times because like they say on the internet once you issue something it's forever so make sure it sounds correctly it's professional and it has the appropriate tone that matters you know, speaking of sounding professional having the right tone saying the right things where did you learn this from where, where could you accredit your public speaking knack for not everybody can do that. Not everybody's comfortable speaking in front of people and sounding great. So how'd you get that going? You know, I think it's just age, to be honest. I have had so many experiences in terms of failures that uh, my speaking ability has improved dramatically based on just doing it more often. I am the uh, local Toastmaster president, which is a small group of people that get together and I will tell you that there are many people at the city and a lot of colleagues of mine, heck, there's all kinds of top, highly known, well-recognized individuals in the media that are just not good speakers. They really are not. And often I come across people who don't think going to Toastmasters is worth their time because I'm a good speaker. Well, okay but everybody can improve public skills, public speaking skills. 
And it's not so much what you say, it's how you say it, and whether it's funny, whether it's emotional, and how you communicate and receive information. And a big part of Toastmasters is evaluation. After every presentation and speech, you get constructive feedback. And every week, I learn something about what I did or didn't do that I can apply at work and, quite frankly, at home. Because communicating with your spouse, that can be challenging too, or with your kids. So listening and learning, no matter who they are, is so important. And again, I didn't have this skill set 10 years ago. I've learned to just be humble and learn from everyone you can. And it's it's been really fun, really fun. And I, I did Toastmasters years ago for a couple of years. And I will say that the reps and then also the critiques and what people tell you about what you just did, what you just said, and how you can improve it, that goes a long way. Because personally, I don't like listening to myself on these podcasts. <laughs> but... <laughs> Because I, I hear all the, you know, how I mumble, how I stutter. I hear all the filler words. That, you know, there you go. You got it. The, the ahs and ums. Just yep. next time you see someone speaking, how many times they go ah and um, <laughs> especially athletes. It blows oh, me away. They're the yeah. worst interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A, the questions are just terrible. And then the, the way they answer the yeah. questions <laughs> terrible. All right. So how does Graham... Um, let, let's say we asked somebody that knew you somewhat well, but they don't work with you. And they asked, and I asked them, what does Graham do all day? And what does he do to serve the community? What would they get totally wrong about that? Well, I'll tell you, the first mistake people make is that every form of government is the same. So when you look at the dysfunction of the federal government and the disruption of the state government, it gets better as you become local government. County is a little more complicated, but city government works very effectively. And so I always tell my friends, when they see or hear something they don't like that the city did, I'll say, really? Well, you know what? You have a concern with that park? Guess what? We don't manage parks. So it's not the city, but that's okay. What is it? And I'll find out what the problem is. So I like to make sure I'm a resource to everyone that has a concern about their water, their trash service, uh, just getting a return phone call. I'll find you a solution. And I believe most local government employees will do the same thing. If you call our city, someone's going to call you back. Love it. Love it. And since you're in, in emergency services, I'm sure there's um there's call there's kind of always a slow burn of uh, thinking about what emergency could potentially happen, right? You're probably always yeah. kind of on the ball thinking about what could potentially go wrong. So how does Graham um, be more mindful about stepping away and kind of recharging the batteries, making sure that Graham is taken care of? Like, what can you do mental health, mental how can you take care of your mental health why, while being under those high pressure situations? Well, you know, everybody's got stuff, you know, and when you run to work and you do your eight to five or eight to 10 or whatever it might be, you're spending probably more time at work than you are at home. You're engrossed in your job. You may love your job. You may not. You may not have the best environment and you may not enjoy your supervisor and it's a constant work in progress. So you've got to get your act together and be healthy physically and mentally. And for me, I've gone through a lot of changes the last few months. It's made it even more difficult. And just to share with people, and I, I learned this because uh, this impacted me directly. I lost my sister to suicide in April and she was my best friend and it was absolutely devastating. And I didn't understand why and what she did. I still don't. I think of her every day. But I have also learned there are so many people that have been impacted by mental illness within their family or friends or colleagues, and it's just overwhelming for me. But about a few weeks back, I saw an article about the National Suicide Support Line, and it's called 988. And I was really taken back because it was really well organized. It was very well thought out. And unlike other national needs, 
This had bipartisan support of Democrats and Republicans, where they actually worked together to get this program upgraded. And now, instead of calling some nine-digit number, you just dial or text 988, and they will be on the line helping you. So I took it upon myself to take that information, and I have since shared it with my city council. I went to the city council meeting. I went to our local park district, our school district, and the county board and shared the same information. And I have had so many people reach out to me to say thank you for talking about something that people don't talk about. It really is a hidden, deadly disease. Depression and suicide are just devastating to people. I've had so many people comment that they were impacted one way or another. And just this last week, our city produced a public service announcement that is now airing locally. And I've shared that with as many people as I can just to get the word out about what 988 does. And so staying healthy and happy and holding on to people close to you. And more importantly, if you see someone that's not doing so well, listen to them. Give them a shoulder to lean on because you know what? Like I said, everybody's got something going on. You've all got, we've all got stuff and life is challenging enough. So don't let people be isolated. Look for help. True. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that. Let's say Graham is commissioned to put up a billboard. And this billboard is going to be in the most trafficked area of Thousand Oaks. What ask of your community in regards to emergency services would, would Graham put on this billboard? Wow. Okay. So if I had that billboard, take nothing for granted and prepare. And you know, stuff's gonna happen, and a lot of it has nothing to do with you. So whether it's a national or natural incident, you've got to be individually prepared to address that one way or another and know where to go and what to do. So that billboard would be not words, it'd probably be an image, and it'd probably be an image of, of you and your family and friends, that those are the people and the resources and the things that matter the most. And work is important because it gives you time with your family. But I'd have a big family board up there and I'd throw in my uh, my my dogs, <clears throat> excuse me, and things that are important to me. And that's music, family, um, friends, and laughter. You know, it'd have to be funny. I think it'd have to be yeah. funny. Funny is, yeah. is healthy. That's the way I have to do it. I like it. I like it. All right. I always like to leave a spot or actually the, the burger question. So let's say I'm coming to Thousand Oaks and I text you ahead of time and I ask you, hey, Graham, where can I go in Thousand Oaks to get the best burger? Where would you send me? You know, I, I thought about that. And while I did think of Harold's omelets on Teal Boulevard, I will just go with a really boring one because I think this company is awesome with their customer service. We went there with my family a couple times and they got the order wrong. And what they do, you get on the phone and they were awesome. They sent us gift cards, then they followed up. I love good follow up, good customer service. And that company is In N Out Burger. Best in burger in town, everywhere you go, best customer service, really well managed, consistent food. And I know this because I spent eight years working for Carl's Jr., I know how to make a burger. <laughs> I will never eat a famous famous star again, by the way. I made too many. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Good old in and out burger. I love I love the fries. Yeah. The fries. All right. So now is a part of the show where I like to let you thank mentors that you had along your journey and then also offer a word of inspiration and motivation to your industry counterparts. Well, my mentors are my public works directors I've had in the past that have all provided great insight. Uh, I will tell you that early in my years, I worked for an amazing city manager named Grant Brimhall. One of the th one of the tricks to the trade that he's always uh, reminded me of is that when you're in a big meeting room and there's 10 people all have something to say, I remember watching him let all nine city managers speak. And then when it came to him, he was purposely last. He would speak slowly and lower his voice so people would lean forward and make sure they heard him. The room was silent because he knew how to deliver a message. He knew the timing. 
And he knew Toast people masters. wanted to hear what he had to say. And I'll always remember that as something really important. But beyond that, um, smile, avoid office conflict, stay in your lane, know your job, highlight the effectiveness of your department and support your boss. But my current supervisors, I know it, you know, it's overkill, but I know you've spoken to Nader Hadari, but he's a mover and a shaker and an amazing leader. But more importantly, he's humble, he's respectful, he's a team yeah. player, and he is up and coming. And I watch him and how he communicates. He does 10 things at once. I can't do everything he does, but I learn from him all the time. And he just embraces change in technology. And he's just one of the top leaders in the industry. And he's just amazing to, to watch. Solid guy right there. And to all the other emergency services managers out there, what do you say to them to, to keep fighting the good fight, You know, keep your head up, keep the faith? What would you say to them? Well, you know, I would tell you that anyone can be an emergency services manager. Just do the homework. Do the homework. Do the certifications. Embrace the role that you have, whether it's within the public works department, which is a little rare for me. Most are in the city manager's office. Several are in the police department and some are in the fire department. But public works is a first responder. Amen. We're first on scene and you can't get anywhere unless you're on our roads. So I've learned to embrace that. But more importantly, respect everyone's role and be sure to know your stuff. Don't walk into a room unprepared and assume you know everything when you really, you never will. The fire department, they need you, and so do the police department and vice versa. But it's an industry that constantly is constantly changing, and they're always needing someone, whether it's at the city level or at the state level. They're completely overwhelmed. And just like trash and water, emergency management will forever be needed. It's not going anywhere. It's only going to get bigger. You look at climate change, extreme weather, they need people who are calm, knowledgeable and our team players and know their stuff so if you want to get into emergency management connect with the international emergency management association connect with uh, several other groups including the public works association but embrace that and become certified and part of that go through the training it, it really makes a difference nice nice and speaking of needing someone i always like to touch on workforce development just 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 briefly um what are you seeing out there that that's working in regards to attracting retaining and and um kind of elevating the talent that's that we talk about supply chain everywhere but i think there's a supply chain of talent uh you know i think there's a supply chain issue in talent finding the right people yeah. getting them in the, on the right seats on the bus so what are you seeing out there what are some best tips tricks practices to get that done more efficiently? Well, you know, I, I've actually considered, I can't do this with my daughter who is uh, 14, but I know people have misgivings or hesitancy with uh, social media, but on the professional end of it, I think it's so important. I think it's as, as important as building your financial credit. Your professional appearance is everything to you. So start or build on what you have now. I really enjoy LinkedIn. I think with some exceptions, it is very professional. And I know the other platforms are there for whether it's uh, you know Facebook and beyond. Those qu aren't quite as useful, but my network on LinkedIn continues to grow. It's like a giant encyclopedia of industry specific information. So you can tailor it to what you want to learn and who you want to connect with. And I've made several contacts. I've even heard from companies that I now do work with. I certainly don't want everyone soliciting me, but I do come across those unique services that you would not otherwise find if you don't have an open mind to what they're doing. And that's where you find cutting edge stuff. And, and then the other, of course, I said is uh, my profile or my work with the uh, IAEM on emergency management and APWA. These are groups that have working uh, committees and areas that you really need to contribute to. And it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of energy from morning to night. And But I think it's important. I think it's important because I'm not going to be doing this forever. And I'd like to think 
what am I going to do after I work in public works in the city? What's next? Well, I'd, I'd like to think that LinkedIn can help me do that because there's yeah. another chapter in my life I haven't found yet and I'm still looking for it. Sure. Sure. Thanks for that answer. All right. Well, um, to all the listeners out there, make sure you share this with somebody who you think needs to hear it. Uh, just want to reiterate what Graham said about if you know somebody that's not doing well, what was the number again? They can dial 988. Just call, text, or email 988, and you'll see a national support line that will have uh, your help right there and ready. Nice, nice. Yeah, make sure you check on the people that you know and people that you love. Um, also, yeah, like I said, share this with somebody who you think needs to hear it. Graham, before we get out of here, any final words for us? You know, I'm just uh, pleased and so happy that you gave me a call. I, I don't know what how where I ended up on your list, but I have heard your other podcasts. I do enjoy them. And Public Works is kind of cool, you know. So those that uh, go to school, don't know what they're going to do in life, take a look at local government. Take a look at Public Works, whether it's an engineer or a mechanic. We are everywhere. And I'm very grateful to work for a great city, and public service is the way to go. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, uh, but on the behalf of myself and Graham, this has been the Public Works Podcast, and thank you for tuning in.